Hello and welcome to the final webinar in the three webinar series on getting started with barcode-based digital data collection for vegetable breeding programs by Michael Mazurik. In these webinars, you will learn user-friendly ways to set up your breeding or trial program with a barcode-based system. The first two webinars were recorded and are available at the Plant Breeding and Genomics YouTube channel. This is your host, Alice Formiga, and I host webinars for two communities that are part of eExtension at extension.org, eOrganic and Plant Breeding and Genomics. This is a Plant Breeding and Genomics webinar, and you can find many other recorded webinars and articles on plant breeding at extension.org, as well as on the Plant Breeding and Genomics YouTube channel. This webinar will also be recorded and we have uploaded a handout of the slides. We've also uploaded barcode ruler and two other handouts, one on using bartender software and a shopping list for digital phenotyping and what you need to get set up. The presentation will last about 45 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. We'll be reading as many questions out loud as we can after the presentation is over. Our presenter today, Michael Mazurik, is the Calvin Noyes Keeney Associate Professor in Plant Breeding and Genetics at Cornell University. His breeding program focuses on the improvement of vegetable crops for organic production systems, as well as identifying genes and developing tools to facilitate vegetable breeding progress. Michael, thank you for joining us again today, and I am now going to hand you the screen controls. Thank you, Alice, and thank you for everyone who's joined. Um, and I'll note today as we go through, much credit to Emily Rodek for all the, the photos we'll be using today. She leads my, my field program and knows many of these uh, technologies uh, really well from a first-hand basis. And as Alice mentioned, this is part three of the webinar series. We'll be referring back to parts one and two as we go. Uh, so you might want to refer to those for reference. Webinar one was the overview, and then we started to get in, into the nitty gritty. And in webinar two, we looked at um, sowing uh, seeds, field observations, how to implement barcodes to really automate the collection of your observations there and all the labeling. Um, and uh, this final one is going to be, I think, one of the more fun detail-oriented ones where you really get to see the nitty-gritty in what do we do with all those squash uh, that we bring in uh, from the field and extract data from it. And so there'll be some uh, many general things, and there'll be some uh, squash-specific things, perhaps, as well. <clears throat> and so this is the, the time of year we're in. So uh, fall in New York right now, uh, we are bringing uh, thousands of pounds of squash in. Uh, last year, we had a good 12 tons of squash we brought in, uh, phenotyped most of it. Here it is curing in these bags, uh, getting ready for us. And as we've started to work with a broader program, more quantitative, and being able to look more deeply into some of the quality information, there's many different aspects of the quality information to integrate. Uh, we can look at things much more finely, um, and which is not necessarily to say that we have a lot more people uh, running uh, the program with us. So how to be more efficient and still be able to do a better job looking in more detail um, we can use the systems I'm going to show you now. So a few people can go through many samples of squash, get the data integrated, and we can look for some very fun relationships. Uh, this graph from a couple years ago, um, where we're looking at the bricks, roughly the sweetness of the squash compared to the dry matter, uh, roughly the, the fineness of the texture. And with you can see here several thousand data points compiled in this plot, uh, where we're very interested in the relationships between sweetness and texture. Uh, finding outliers uh, to be able to look at more um, and just this is the system that allows us to be able to do all this. So exciting to share with you guys. Um, so first step, uh, harvest mode 
it's a matter of getting your labels, all those barcode labels we talked about for the stakes in the earlier webinars, now transferring those to harvest bins and the fruit themselves. Um, so typically we are starting out by staging uh, bins uh, where uh, next to the appropriate plots in the field, uh, we can bring in lots of different groups uh, to help us harvest those. Here's one uh, student group that's visiting that got enlisted in the harvest uh, that day. Um, and as we label the bins, we're often using these slip-on tags. Um, and so these can go right through the laser printer uh, with the barcode software uh, you're able to get the barcodes associated with those and the, the human readable text so that when you go to check these crates in later, pull fruit out of them, it's a, the fastest way to be able to transfer the information in the label right into a spreadsheet software. Um, and this will be the first example I'll note in uh, some of the handouts we have. Uh, there's a digital phenotyping setup. Um, and these are the first of the items that are listed in there, a breakdown of what we use, some tips about which ones uh, we found are the most useful, a sample uh, model number if you're searching around for these, uh, and some costs. So you can really start to see all these different elements, how it adds up, um, and which things we found to work well. Uh, we don't mean that as an endorsement per se, and we'd be very interested if you find some things that work uh, better for you, um, but it's definitely a starting point as you start to look for these and are searching largely for horticultural labels. Um, one challenge with this model you can see, and we're switching to a different one, um, these tags, you can rip them off in strips and then put them around the crates here as you uh, to label everything and just putting them all with the tags out. Uh, you can go through all these pallet bins very quickly to see what you have, uh, find the crate you want to work with. Um, these are going across the page, and as it feeds through in portrait mode, it gets a little crinkly. Um, you can also buy these that are are uh, vertically oriented the long way. You don't get as many per sheet, but they can feed through most laser printers really well. Uh, this will just go through any laser printer uh, you have. Uh, if you have one that's a letter R feed and it can go through sideways, that's where these work. And so you can see this is working, but a little bit of a challenge for us um, with this particular model. This also comes with these rip-off tags. Uh, so that can be also very handy as you pull samples off put it in a bag, uh, you can rip off that tag and toss it in. Um, so now you have the bin labeled, it's ready with the barcode, and sometimes we're just bringing the crate in using directly out of that for all the measurements. Uh, other times, like we're doing right now, we're starting to do taste tests. And so we need to take the fruit off out of the bin, wash it up, um, and start to keep track of each fruit individually. Um, and to do that, uh, you see we're printing out the serialized barcodes. Um, this one is a multi-copy one, um, and we'll show you about that next. Uh, and then after the fruit is washed, if it's still wet, to be able to take these barcodes and have it go with it, um, we use so much masking tape in our program. And so this thin thing of masking tape will keep this uh, associated with the fruit. Uh, if you have fruit that you're letting sit for seed extract, you don't get to it, the, the wrap around the masking tape, even if the fruit starts to, to decompose on you, the masking tape will keep the label with it. Um, and here you can see the masking tape has gone between the barcode labels, this one a little bit onto it, but there's still a good swatch of it that can be read in one dimension by the scanner. Uh, so we're not compromising the, the label, although we will maybe remove a little ink uh, when the tape comes off. So. We have those fruit ready, and this is the, the first thing they all see when they come into our workroom. Uh, so we have this phenotyping set up to collect all the morphometric data, and we're looking at weights, dimensions, colors, and printing out the further label we need for uh, all the other steps. And every fruit that comes in is going to get a barcode label that's going to stick with it for the duration of its time. Uh, all the samples and each thing will be tracked, and we can bring back all different observations we make over many different times uh, into one spreadsheet by virtue of it having that barcode label associated with it. So 
the computer is really busy in this station. So we'll talk about station one here, that morphometric uh, station. Um, there are many, many uh, connections that are made uh, here. Um, and so all together we have a, a barcode scanner here. The 1D one is critical. You'll see why. A barcode printer to be able to generate more labels, uh, especially as we're taking out of the crate, we can just scan it in and get a bunch of labels for those squash spit out. Um, a little different than we do if we're doing taste tests where you see them taped uh, to the squash. Um, a scale with a keyboard wedge. And the wedge is what's going to input the data from the scale, the software that translates it into the spreadsheet. Uh, colorimeter we often have, uh, and also some digital USB calipers. And so as we get the computer set up, um, we have many windows going on the screen. Uh, one here that's running the barcode uh, software to print out more labels, the keyboard wedge here that's going to be translating the data coming in through some of the USB inputs and the colorimeter data set up and running. And then next will be to get the spreadsheet software that all of this can can talk to. So this computer is really busy, a lot of USB ports. And with many of the more less mainstream uh, things like the the calipers and certainly um, anything that has this wedge associated with it. You can see there's all these different COM ports you need to specify. Uh, so one thing that is key is a little bit of ability to navigate that. Uh, I can show you how here. Um, so as you plug in uh, a new device, so here's the scale, and it's just showing up as this kind of generic USB powered box here, USB serial port. Um, and so know what COM port that is to tell the software, um, you know, which to look at. Um, in Windows anyway, uh, we go to the device and printers section here under the control panel. Uh, it opens up this screen to allow you to see what devices are connected. And then if you further click on this, it'll open up another window. Now, the key thing here is you see this COM3. And that is referring to a specific input on the computer. For these purposes, it's which USB port. And as people want to use a computer, plug in different things, uh, a flash drive or you know what have you into the USB ports, um, and you go to plug the scale back in, it's critical you put it back into the same USB port. Uh, so in some instances, we have the computer labeled with a sticker on the computer and on the USB cord for the scale, so, you know, saying you know, which what to plug in where. But even to get to that point, just being able to do these couple steps, you can see this COM3. Uh, and so you now know, well, it's the COM3 setting that all the data will go through. Some things it's automatic. Some things you really have to be able to do those two steps to see where it's going to come from. The other uh, thing is we have everything coming in, uh, and we want to say we're getting fruit right out of the bin, uh, and we want to print off some barcodes. Here's a resource that we're going to find a way to be able to uh, share with everyone with all the rest of the documentation uh, that goes with these webinars um, is some little uh, uh, files that if you just drag them onto your desktop and you have bartender software running, uh, these will just expand the functionality of it. Um, even without that, um, uh, many of these uh, software companies have some great tech support. Um, and they are the ones that actually walked us through how to set this up. Uh, there's many alternatives to Bartender, um, but we'll show you just for Bartender how we do this. So we have multiple fruits. We showed earlier in the webinars how we keep track of things. So you can see 2017, plot 629, fruit 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Instead of typing all that out, um, you can auto-increment it. In um, uh, Bartender, they call it uh, the serial. Uh, uh, command. So we see these serial numbers. And so we can say we want to have uh, five auto increments and the number of copies per serial number. Uh, we'll actually often have 
many labels, many copies will print uh, as a fruit gets split up in many different directions. One barcode will go with each stream, each chunk of the fruit. Uh, so we might use five or six copies. But if we have five fruit, then we want to auto increment it five times. And you can see it here, one, two, three, four, five. The same way if in the spreadsheet software you dragged down uh, from the, the corner of the box and filled down, it'll advance one every time, the software will do it automatically. And so we can be scan in the bin um, into uh, the barcode software, say we want five fruit, and it will print us out five individualized labels for those that can be scanned in and tracked from there. Uh, and as you have questions with this and go to implement it, um, there is another PDF um, that is uh, uh, titled uh, Howdy, uh, first word in the file, uh, when you go open up the text file. But that PDF uh, will take you through some of the steps if you want to see some of the nitty gritty that's specific to bartender and how to get that set up. Um, I'll note that these labels, they're water resistant. Uh, there's a, we use a fluorotherm material now. There's also different plastic labels if you need something more durable. So as the fruit comes in, all labeled up, ready to go here. Um, in the, the top right, um, after we scan that in, uh, we put it on the USB scale, we hit the print button, the mass of the fruit is transmitted right into Excel. Um, and then next step is to slice it. Uh, we have this uh, squash guillotine we've created. Uh, two handles are important to keep everybody's fingers safe. You can't cut your finger if it's if they're all on the handle. Um, and we, a metal slide uh, we've set up to be able to move the knife up and down in some wobbly fruit on uh, this kind of V channel they nest in. Um, and so you can just slice through the squash pretty quickly. These knives we get, uh, uh, cheese wheel knives, there's some ones we find off eBay. The key is to find one that's thin. Uh, if you find a nice, really thick one, you think it's gonna be very strong, it ends up much more as a splitting wedge than a slicing tool. Um, and uh, these, we're starting to see some other people start to make these um, as well. It's a great way to keep your fingers safe. Uh, uh, there's other people that have something that looks a little bit more like a paper cutter where it's hinged. Uh, those work well too, but not for a large pumpkin. Now that it's sliced, you can put it on the barcode ruler. Um, so here we made this little uh, wooden uh, backstop for it right at the zero line. Um, the barcode ruler here is um, something we've printed out and laminated. And if you'd like a copy of ours, it's available in the handout section. As you print it out, um, please just make sure to turn off the scaling and measure it to make sure it did print out faithfully to size and you haven't shrunk it to fit on a page or something. Um, by slicing the fruit in half, that's one of the key next steps and you do it now because now the fruit's gonna sit flat on this ruler uh, and as you pass the 1D barcode laser down the fruit, handheld, um, the first visible barcode that reads across here, that laser line, is going to go right into the computer as the, the length of the fruit. You can then turn it 90 degrees, pass it down again, and do the width. Um, and the 1D scanner, uh, this is one of the most critical places to just have the older technology because it enables you to use this as a ruler, a trick we learned from the Buckler Lab. Uh, as you have other internal dimensions, it doesn't work. Uh, and so for that, if you want to measure uh, the thickness of the neck here, it's gonna be hard to get that dimension as you wanted to measure the seed cavity, that's also hard. Uh, so instead we can get these digital USB calipers. Uh, an example of the one we use is also in the handout online. Uh, this lets you do all the internal dimensions, small or much more precise dimensions. This uh, barcode ruler is gonna be pretty coarse to the nearest half centimeter. And with the calipers, uh, you can get you know much more accurate measurements than the biology of the organism actually uh, follows. Um, and so also USB input uh, goes right into your spreadsheet software uh, through the cable. So with there, uh, you've been able to go through, get the weight, length, width, any other size measurements. Uh, we can also pass it on to the color measurements or any other things you could tie in at this stage. 
But for us, the next step is imaging. Uh, and here you can see our uh, photo setup. And I'll take walk you through the steps and what we did and how to make it work. And it's really be a bulletproof setup. Um, and here you can see, and uh, uh, we've removed one component here. There's usually a piece of white plastic that curves around. Uh, and so you can see this is pretty easy to set up um, with some shop lights, CFL bulbs uh, to hold everything. We just have the cinder blocks and a, a table um, to clamp everything to, and then the camera is on uh, an old photo enlarger table, um, but you can also in the see some of the setup things, ways you can just get some clamps that will clamp right onto a table or a two by four you have there or a tripod. Okay. So the work lights we have, we have six and positioned around to minimize glare. The plastic we normally have curve around this area uh, also helps reflect light in to remove shadows. A uh, key thing there is we're using these 5,000 Kelvin CFL bulbs. That refers to their color temperature. The flash on a camera is right around 5,000 K in temperature. Uh, you'll see here a copy of the end of the box we ripped off. Uh, so this natural daylight, 5,000 K, that is just a pure white light, and it ends up making it very easy uh, to take good pictures by just is having a very perfect uh, light that's not going to require much compensation. Um, we have a tripod here, something to hold it. Um, the clamp you could also get is in the, the shopping list. A digital SL SLR camera. Um, one that we've tried is also in the list. A uh, different model is, is here. Um, but the SLR camera is key because you can set the lens to a certain zoom and much of the light coming in will be dependent on how zoomed in it is. Uh, and so this is just a great way to be able to lock something in as we go to take 5,000 squash mug shots. At the base, you'll see this gray linoleum piece that the squash is sitting on. Um, that is important for a neutral color. It also just helps the pictures turn out well uh, by themselves, help foolproof the system. Uh, the linoleum is important. Uh, many of you I know have some great paper backgrounds. As you go through thousands of squash, you know, start to get seeds and uh, squash guts everywhere. Um, and so to have a clean photo, um, you'll need to have a, a wipe down surface. So gray linoleum works for us. Um, a white milk board is the white plastic we use. It's a thin sheet that's bendable. Most uh, home improvement stores will have it. It's also in the handout. We have a little ruler there for the internal scale um, and the, our sponge bucket to wipe this down in between. So you can see on the right, uh, the overhead view that the photographer sees, um, and you see there's the ruler uh, for scale, the squash, one up, one down, so you can see the rind and also the internal things, the flesh color, seed cavity, and you can see the barcodes that have traveled with as the internal label. Okay. And how you go to set up the camera, we talked a little bit about it the last time. Here at the bottom is a, just a picture of the the, the camera, the LCD screen on the camera, so you can see the settings we use, and I'll just walk you through how you fine-tune these for your setup, um, and some of the critical ones are going to be here, the shutter speed, um, which is going to be dictated largely by the amount of light you have, and the f-stop, the aperture you choose, so that drives a lot of it. Um, as you look at, this is a pretty small squash, and so it doesn't need much aperture adjustment. As you can imagine, a very large pumpkin there on the screen, um, you're going to have something very close to the camera and, and also still want to see the ruler and barcodes. Uh, so to have all that in focus, you need to go to a large number here on the aperture. Um, we want to make sure the it's a high resolution file, but not too big to fill up our hard drive. Um, we will set the white balance. Um, aperture priority. Uh, here there's an autofocus priority. Um, so let's go through those steps so you can see how we set it up. So first, uh, this is key with the digital SLR camera, is we're going to get it mounted on the tripod and adjust the height of the camera and the zoom by turning the, the lens to get the desired area in, in view. So we want to be, a, be pretty zoomed in on the vegetables we're going to be bringing through, 
uh, so we don't have a lot of wasted space. We have to crop down later uh, and get a good resolution. Um, but we also don't want to be so zoomed in, we have to zoom back out for many of the samples. Uh, key thing here and the advantage of the SLR camera is one once you get it set to the zoom you want, we tape the lens. Um, uh, with a lot of folks using the equipment, one of the best ways to make sure the settings are how you like, uh, super glue and duct tape are great ways to make sure all the settings are fixed. Um, so that will set the amount of light coming in in the zoom. Next step, we set the white balance. Um, and so a button on the back of the camera, you just press the WB button. Uh, you'll turn the dial to you get a setting like this for a custom. Um, and then you put something pure white underneath. Um, if you use a piece of paper, stack up several so none of the background uh, darkness bleeds through. That whiteboard works well. Um, you can also use um, some fo uh, photography uh, intended cards that are pure white for setting white balance. Um, there's some links in the handout for where to go for those. But you just simply just have a pure white object under the camera, press the button, and your white balance is set. The next step is to set the exposure. Uh, and so there's this aperture priority mode. Uh, looking at the dial, it's a little obscured by the semi-clear tape, but there's an A there that says aperture priority mode. So we crank up or crank down the aperture to something that is about uh, 10 or 8. And so then you have a very small opening with a large large depth of field, you can have the near part of surface of the pumpkin and the bottom where your labels are all in focus. Um, we slip a gray card in. So this is a piece of gray uh, paper or plastic that's a, a neutral color, a neutral darkness for the camera. Again, where to get uh, some examples of those are in the handout. And um, by either filling the whole field of view with that gray object, um, you can uh, be able to get a good reading through your camera and what your shutter speed should be. Or if you go to the spot metering, um, there'll be a, an option on your camera that will let you just focus on one part of uh, what's in the field of view. When you hold the shutter down halfway, you can see the shutter speed. Um, and then you can switch to manual mode uh, enter those in. So if I go back a slide, you'll see here you know, it's 125th of a second um, and uh, f-stop of 10. So you turn the dials till you get to those settings. Uh, in manual mode, so you can see the camera's here at M. Um, and then we taped the dial. Um, you also see we taped the flash down. Um, and this makes it so anything the camera tries to do to accentuate the photo for this particular sample that's going to make it uh, either much darker or artificially colored, um, then all the other samples make it not taken under the same uh, settings. Um, this blocks it out and any aspiring photographers that come to uh, change the settings for a couple things or might come to take some photos, uh, change the settings and forget to put them back before everybody shows up and cranks through a couple hundred squash the next day. Um, this makes it just a very one use purposeful camera and why we use the SLR camera um, and find it's working really well. Um, you can, here we have an older one that we got a wireless Wi-Fi card for. Most cameras now come with Wi-Fi. The beautiful thing is this camera is now transmitting every picture it takes to a computer uh, in our workroom. Uh, it's also plugged in with a USB, uh, sorry, an AC adapter power cord. So we don't have to worry about the batteries dying. We don't have to worry about the storage card getting full. It's just there powered on as a resource constantly for us. And we have these guidelines taped up next to it to make sure we get good photos. Um, it's important we find that not only is it a clean surface and to remind people a little bit um, about what they should be doing so if we want to use these for a presentation uh, it will look nice um, 
But as we have many photos, and we might want to put them together in contact sheets, flip through to look at the program, it's nice if everything isn't uh, jumping across the screen. So we have a ruler across the top, um, and so it's important there to have one without glare, uh, so you can read the numbers. Um, and we have the squash spaced evenly next to that, but not touching it. So if we want to crop the photo and just have a picture of the squash without uh, the ruler in the photo, um, that's something we can do is having the space there. You can see that the barcode is very readable. We could still scan this and be able to label the photos by uh, highlighting the name of the file and scanning this and use that to input the names. But there is a little bit of glare on it. So one thing that people should watch as they're going through is to make sure there's not too much glare. Uh, you can see a few shadows here in the image, um, but with some glare, it'll be hard to actually read that internal name. Right? So with this setup, you can see it's pretty simple, straightforward, and it's a great way to get many good, consistent photographs um, of, uh, of whatever vegetables you're working with. Next, uh, one of those halves comes out for the bricks process. And so we have these bins of halves um, where we will take a slice, uh, put one of these barcodes in the plastic bag with it. They are water resistant enough so this lasts. So the barcode is facing out. Uh, and we'll fill up the freezer with hundreds of these. They'll freeze slowly. It's important they freeze kind of slowly so that you start to break down the plant tissue. Um, and then we'll get them out, thaw them. We have a 2D barcode scanner here. There's some tabletop or handheld ones. The 2D one we find is very fast and efficient and able to capture these well, even right through the plastic bag. And just snip off the corner with our scissors, uh, squeeze it onto the refractometer here, uh, and get a BRICS reading. Um, there are now refractometers available uh, that take the BRICS readings, but they don't uh, with Bluetooth, uh, but they don't transmit directly to the spreadsheet. They store up the data and will download it. Um, we like to see the sample number and um, the data matching up as we go. This is a little bit too much uh, faith that everything is being stored properly for us. We still use the digital one though and still collect the sample ID with the barcode. Uh, next step uh, from the same fruit slices is dry matter. Um, and so we, you, here you can see the one barcode in the plastic bag, and out for bricks. The other is in the weigh boat here on the bottom. And we slice up the, the fruit, try to get about 20 grams. Uh, so we still have the good number of significant digits for some low dry matter stuff as it uh, dries down. Uh, we can scan it in. Here's the 1D scanner. You can also use a 2D scanner here. They all work fine. Um, the important thing is, as we start to work with these aluminum foil weigh boats that can survive the drying oven, they're reflective. So be careful about shining the red light laser uh, into the mirrored surface and looking into it. So just try not to uh, get that uh, deflection going. Um, but we scan it. Um, it goes on the scale and we get the wet weight. Um, and we'll collect all that as a file. The bricks was a separate file on one computer. We're off to station four, another computer here uh, for us because we try to get a lot of people all working uh, on this uh, to get through the squash quickly in the fall. Uh, so we get a weight uh, for the wet. They go in this dehydrator. The one we use is in the, the handouts, and we'll let this go um, one to two days, depending on the humidity uh, in the room. Um, and then we can scan in the sample um, and take the weight again on the same USB scale. Um, and you see how these dry weight file and the wet weight file and the bricks file um, and all the other morphometric data, the barcode is really key to bringing that together. For the scales, you can see that we're using this one, it's 400 grams with a 0.01 gram resolution. As we bring a uh, larger fruit in from the field and weighing the whole squash, you know, wh whatever your veggie may be, we're there using a, a 6,000 gram capacity scale that has a 0.1 gram uh, capacity. For the dry matter, uh, something that has a higher resolution is critical for us.
Okay. So that's through the, the process. Uh, we've used a lot of barcode stickers. So for each squash for us, um, we are using five stickers. Um, so one is for the brick sample. Uh, one is for the dry matter. We scanned it in twice, once when it comes in, once when it comes out. Um, there's, and when we do the photograph, there's a label that was in there. It's uh, still usable uh, at the end, um, but it's a place where it's very handy to have. Uh, and for our seeds, um, we'll put a, a barcode in with the seed packets uh, when it goes into the dryer. Um, so we'll usually wrap them up in some craft paper when it comes out. We have a fresh one there to stick on the seed packet. And as we're approaching winter nurseries and we decide there's some standout specimen we want to be able to send down and to be able to get that uh, in the mail without having to dig through all the hundreds of packets uh, we have in the drying oven. Um, we also put a sticker on the outside so we can sort through all the samples pretty fast. Uh, with a taste test, we were doing some handwritten labels. We've moved to using the barcodes there too. Just because you don't have any typos, there's no transposed, uh, there, there's no errors. Um, we had one recently that uh, tasted really good. We looked at the number. It's not a number that we had planted that year. Uh, so if we had the barcode, we could have avoided that error. So using these stickers, um, it is at a cost, um, but it's going to replace six handwritten labels where you're relying on someone uh, to, for each of these to label something uh, clearly and perfectly to not switch any numbers. So the other, the place that's really critical is at the end, as I mentioned, you have all these separate data files. Um, uh, on the left is the screenshot of a slice of some of our data where you'll see we have all these fruit IDs, the systems we use. You can see in the other webinars, but this tells me it's 2017 plot 265 trial E rep A fruit 2. And that's specific to each fruit. Um, the first morphometrics data station, we collected the, the weight, the length, the width. Sometimes we'll also have the color data tagged on there too. Um, but towards something we can analyze, look for relationships between these, uh, calculate the dry matter by um, subtract, comparing wet and dry weights. Those are all separate files. And so this is key toward merging them. Because right now we just want our BRICS data that's in the separate file now on the same master spreadsheet. You could do this by hand. Uh, we used to do it as we went um, and just say here, this fruit uh, A1 and take this BRICS reading, which is not, not so great, um, over uh, to this column. Um, this sample, it would go here. Uh, this one which is a little bit better, that would go there. There's a lot of scrolling up and down and looking in places for error. Um, by having the exact same fruit ID and that barcode getting copied and going with every chunk of the fruit we looked at, we're able to match these up precisely, or rather the software can. So key thing, this is one of the biggest reasons you need barcodes is so everything is written down exactly the same every time. So if you haven't used VLOOKUP before, um, I can give you the quick version. So basically, we want the BRICS value associated with this fruit to go into this cell here. And then we're going to fill it down and have all the BRICS values just added to this column of the table. So we type into the cell equals VLOOKUP, parentheses. And what we want to look up is the fruit with this ID. That's the value we want to put there. So uh, we'll add that. So we put in A2 as the cell where that information is. When we fill down the auto increment of A2, A3, that will happen automatically. And then we tell it, well, where are these BRICS values? Um, and so we just highlight um, this whole region where we have the IDs and the BRICS values in a separate spreadsheet or separate file. And then that will fill it into the formula automatically for you. Um, then is going to look through this file. What values do you want it to return? Well, here's the BRICS values in this column. It's in the second column. Why they don't just say it's column B, I'll never know. Uh, but they call it column two. I guess the second one in the range. Um, and so 
that is what it's going to return. And you also want to add false. Um, and so there's an option to return. If it doesn't find an exact match, just find something that's close uh, to a match. Um, uh, we want the exact uh, matches transferred and only those. Okay, so it's just so as we go through, um, we'll just fill down, um, and they'll auto increment this part in red. The the ID it's going to search for, um, that's great. But as we fill down, it'll also increment where this table is, and it'll move down. Um, so to avoid that, we use these dollar signs. And so this is something you have to go in and add. And so if you dollar A, dollar two, the same for the B, that means as you fill down, it's just going to be looking the same exact range in this other spreadsheet. Uh, it's not going to, as this goes to A3, it won't change this to A3. And then with that, uh, we have a merged spreadsheet um, where all the BRICS data it could find are now in this column and kind of faithfully matched um, and to the exact fruit we can start to go through things and why this is really valuable that they line up is say we find a fruit that is unripe. Um, and so you can go through and uh, be able to remove um, uh, everything uh, that is associated with an unripe fruit and purge all of its data. Um, you'll see these missing data here. So you can combine uh, all your BRICS data with uh, before you do VLOOKUP, so it's doing it all at once, or you can sort this and do that progressively and take all the NAs, move it to the bottom and re VLOOKUP. Uh, as you go into STAT software, we like to use um, the system where we have 17265A2, and you can export that into a text file and re import it using the delimitation function. Um, and you'll get it separated out here, and that will go right into a lot of the stat software. Um, so you can look at individual repeated measurements of individual fruit, plots, years, etc. Okay. So now well, we've taken the whole season from sewing to that final data set to an analyze. Some of the key points we tried to share um, is adopting the barcode labels really helps you streamline a lot of your data collection. Uh, there's a lot of routine things you'd be writing down over and over with some errors along the way. This lets you really streamline all of that. Any routine responses. Um, automatically can be input into your spreadsheet. Um, there are some initial upfront costs, and for some elements, it can be really high. Some things like the printing, you can send away and people will custom print for you. Um, we found the whole system paid for itself the first season, just looking at the amount of uh, extra help we had to hire to do some really basic tasks. Uh, and other places we've been able to expand what we do to let people do some more intellectually stimulating uh, things than just uh, copying over some labels. One of some of the downsides is you need to really plan ahead. Um, get every have have all the supplies. You can't just scribble it down in the margins as you go. Um, so here, you're, um, that is a key thing um, for. Um, how you're going to approach um, new systems. Uh, you won't get all the right observations ahead of time until you've worked with the crop for a little bit. Um, you'll hear people that will tell you that there are, um, the screens are too hard to read outdoors. Um, you, uh, the sunlight will block them out, et cetera. Um, we don't find that to be the case. People are using their phones uh, just fine outside. Uh, you might have problems with your laptop, but not with some of the devices that are really made for this. Um, and as you have any other uh, questions, minutes, but otherwise webinars web and two, webinars, web and, webinars one and two really introduce some of the background for this. Okay. So with that, I'd like to thank the, the group of people that really helped us develop this technology, uh, proof it, uh, and Alice for helping us host today. Uh, also, uh, the USDA NEFA AFRI program uh, for uh, the censorship for the, the grant that uh, allowed it on a large scale 
and be able to share with you today. Thank you. So um, moving on to the questions here, the first question here, did you look into image analyses instead of the measuring fruit length and color, taking into account that you anyway take a picture of the fruits? How do you deal with traits that are not measured in this process, but that you want to select for? So that's a couple questions there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have worked with the, the image analysis software, um, um, the program's uh, tomato analyzer. Turns out it works very well as squash and pepper analyzer, et cetera. Um, so that's a good program. There, it tend, they tend to work the best if you're putting them on a flatbed scanner. Um, and what we're capturing here is um, some more data uh, well, some more aesthetics um, that we can share. Um, but you're absolutely right. There's a lot you can do with, you know, the flatbed scanner and capturing uh, some of that uh, more precise data. That's for sure. And they can be semi-automated analysis. Um, so yeah, um, those are times when that is very useful in, instead of this. Um, the other thing was about things we didn't capture in this. So as we are going out in the field uh, in webinar two um, or any other information, the key thing is rather than looking at this as um, a data sheet, uh, uh, as many uh, plant breeders would, you're looking at really data columns. And so you have an individual uh, sample, a plot of fruit you're collecting data from it and you're collecting columns of data and so you're getting an attribute um, and you would just at the end merge everything um, to be able to do that so yeah so we get uh, data that kind of comes in uh, later in the year we'll do storage trials um, and so a couple of months from now we get another set of data is just that V lookup to take those observations and add it to the growing data set for the year Okay, um, this person is asking, I may have missed it, but are you using some kind of database to store your phenotopic data? If not, why not? And if yet, which one and why merge things in Excel instead of compiling into the database? Yeah, um, so our database is Excel. Um, you can, uh, and we will just have a, um, a set of files um, that they are linked year to year. You can, in um, webinar one or two, we showed our, our system where we have the current plot and the source seed packet. Um, so you can kind of trace everything together that way. Um, and we are looking at getting that into some of the plant breeding softwares. I think uh, that would um, have some merits uh, to this, but for right now, we're really just dealing with um, how we make selections during a year. I would love to have something that handled photographs better uh, as we put our field books together and we're gonna go through the field having something that could take the all the plot information and also tag on some of the the data and a representative photo from the past years would be a big advantage to us. Uh, I would love any suggestions. Okay. Um, you mentioned a specific type of material that you use for your labels that is water resistant. Um, can yep. you repeat what that was? And do you print them with a regular printer or with a special printer? Yep. Um, so for the barcode labels, um, we were using, you can find, we use a two inch by one inch label um, for almost everything except the field stakes. We were using polypropylene or polyethylene plastic labels because we really wanted to be super durable and waterproof. We've learned that that was more expensive than it was worth. So this is a paper label with a waterproof coating and a water resistant adhesive. It's called fluorotherm. For many of these uh, things related to labeling your plants, uh, the key is as you search to use, to look for horticultural labels um, and that opens you up to all the, the plant specific printers and things um, in the shopping list uh, we have some of the part numbers we use and if you search for that um, you can find it um, and then there's many 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 distributors we don't want to necessarily recommend a certain one so you can with that information you can search and find many of them 
maybe better ones than I had. Um, the printer, those slip-on tags, we love those. Um, those you can run through your standard laser printer. You can get the uh, Avery, at least, has the sheets of labels. You can run through um, a laser printer also that we assume you have access to. Um, for these individual stickers we're using, those we have a label printer. Um, and any label printer would do, but the key thing is it's a thermal transfer. So they use a ribbon that has a wax substance that gets thermally stuck on uh, to the plastic labels, the plastic coated labels. Uh, um, that works really well. Uh, and so there's a number of people that distribute these, um, people that are point of sale device specific and can talk you through some options. Um, but this is what we found works the best. Um, what we buy and what we use is in the, um, the shopping list guide. And you can see prices and what we've tried and what we've kind of settled on works for us. OK. Um, for other observations, you can print sheets of barcodes um, for list values that can be scanned for entering into a spreadsheet. This improves accuracy for common values. So that was yes. good. Hmm? Exactly. No, that's a great point. That was a big point, especially with an webinar too. Um, it's how we've upcycled our clipboards. Instead of writing the data on it, we'll take all the, so we have different powdery mildew ratings or different scales, or if we want to repeatedly say this is a bush habit, this is a vine habit, um, you can just print a barcode that says that. There's a human readable text below, so you're sure you're scanning the right one. And we will stick these to a page on a clipboard and just go through the field and we scan the plot stakes and then we can scan those observations directly into Excel um, and um, it's a great way to go. You'll also find, and this is something people found very helpful in webinar two, there is a little bit of code you can put into Excel. There's an automatic carriage return. So with the BRICS measurements is we'll scan in um, the, or especially the dry matter. So we're gonna scan the sample the, you, the scale will enter the weight digitally, and there's a little bit of code we have. It's really easy to add, even I can do it, um, that when you uh, enter in the last value, it'll automatically drop down a row and start over the first column. So it's really as fast as your hands can wave something across the scanner and hit the button on the scale and it stabilizes. Your spreadsheet is automatically filling for you. You don't need to touch the keyboard. Great. Okay. Um, if anybody has any more questions, we'll just um, leave one more half minute here for you to type in because it seems like that's it. But um, this is definitely a golden opportunity, so don't be shy about asking questions. Uh, we'll just leave another minute. And um, yeah, somebody requested that we have all the handouts for all the slides available, and um, I put them all up on that page. Somebody commented that one of them has full screen slides, and she'd rather have them as three per page, so I can definitely modify that and have that available within the next oh hour or two. It takes a little while to refresh, but I can go yep. in and do that. That's pretty easy. So looks like that is it for the questions. you have any other last minute comments, sir, Michael? No, I uh, thank everybody for doing this and as we uh, joining us for these and as we uh, will continue to try to get some more resources uh, that are available uh, here and as people have comments or suggestions as they found some better ways to do things, uh, we'll welcome those. We've definitely integrated a lot of input from a lot of people to make our system uh, what it is and it still could be better. Okay, great. Thank you very much, um, everyone, for all your questions. Like I said, you can find all the archived webinars at this link on your screen. Um, please feel free to contact me after the webinar if you have trouble finding any of these resources. And um, I'd like to thank everyone who attended all the webinars in this series, and thank you. <laughs>